Save more than half price on Purdue Fresh Lake quarters, only 99 cents per pound. Florida strawberries or fresh blueberries, just $4.99 per package. Save $2.30 on Friendly's ice cream, just $4.29 for a 48 ounce tub. Hot price on DiGiorno Rising Crust Pizza, only $8.50 for a 12 inch box. Save $3 on Pompeian olive oil, only $6.99 for a 24 ounce bottle. Visit our website at www.marketplace.pm for more weekly specials. Live from Bermuda Broadcasting, this is ZBM TV 9 News. Good evening, everyone. It's Tuesday, February the 13th, 2018. I'm Diane Brewer, and thank you for joining us tonight. The unveiling of the first PLP budget tonight, just two days away, with all eyes on what David Burt, the Premier and Finance Minister, plans to do. One person who will have her eyes locked on the details of the budget is Jean Atherton, the opposition leader. Speaking to Mike Sharp today, Mrs. Atherton described the Premier's task as a great balancing act between what Mr. Burt promised the country and what he can actually deliver. I think from my perspective I look at it and I say that um, he took a he took a tact which was to say let people understand what I'm contemplating. He put a lot of emphasis on the revenue side. He talked about some of the options that he might have to um, consider. He had some consultation so people could give him feedback. Obviously in between there we had a few things that happened like that um, President Trump came up with his, his tax changes that impacts. But I do think that if people of Bermuda have to contemplate and think that whatever um, consultation feedback that the Premier and the Finance Minister got, he still has to weigh up where does he need to be in terms of getting the revenue to a certain level. Now, I, I have heard, and I said heard, because even though I've heard it, I can't say categorically this is going to happen. I have heard that in based on his consultation, he might not do some of the things that he said that he would do with respect to the, the payroll taxes and the general services tax. So I've heard that. But until such time as I see that he's produced the budget, I can't say. But what I do think, and, and I've tried to stress, is the fact that we didn't hear a lot about the in initiatives that he might actually put in place. Because the revenue is up there, trying to grow the economy, he's talking about growing the economy. He's, but at the same time, if we do not get the expenses under control, then we're never going to be able to turn around and bring the debt down. The ability of government to take control of expenses will ultimately dictate the feasibility of new government initiatives, says Mrs. Atherton. And I always say to, to people that you, you want new things, but everybody wants new things. But if you're in your own household, you'd say, okay, I'm going to go with these new items. What is it going to cost me? Do I have to give up something else in order to make, to, in order to make my, my financial expenditure budget work? So I think that that's what I was... I was hoping, and we'll obviously see it on Friday, because he'll tell us all what new initiatives. But sometimes you should let the people know that if I do this, this is what it's going to cost us, and this is the amount of money I have to find. Or I, you know, there are some initiatives that, that we promised, and they're so important to us that we have, we have to give up something else in order to make it happen. In other news, government is still looking at purchasing five new garbage trucks to bolster the current fleet, but there is a question as to the quantity of waste the new trucks should be able to carry. To this end, government, along with relevant stakeholders, will be getting together to carry out some tests, according to David Birch, the public works minister, who was responding to reporters' questions recently. Um, the concern, really, I think, of the president of the union and ourselves is the amount of waste they can actually carry. Okay. And so, yes, the, uh, the short answer is yes. This is the reason why we are having a team of all of the stakeholders in garbage collection mm -hmm. um, go and see and test and drive and select the next um, batch of garbage trucks that we will purchase. Is there an amount that has been allocated to the purchase of those vehicles? They're about $90,000 a piece, okay. so $450,000. And as for the time frame to have the five new garbage collection staff in place? Um, I have a three-week deadline, and we're on day eight. So, yes, I expect that they will be hired within that three-week time frame. Um, there's the, the, um, the people who have been selected are people who applied to the ministry some time ago. So we're not advertising, even though we've had some new applications that have been submitted um, since my last 
conference. Um, what we did was to go back into the files and pull out people who had applied some time ago, so their vetting and all of that process is already taken. And what we've been able to do is to eliminate the advertising time. Um, so I expect that um, and by the end of by the end of next week is my deadline next week Friday, but I expect long before then that they will be hired. And everyone, don't forget to socialize with us online. News, news, and even breaking news anytime on our ever-growing Twitter and Facebook pages. We have lots of videos, photos, comments, and links to the news you can use 24-7. So be sure to like, click, share, and follow us today. Stay with us. More news in tonight's AccuWeather Forecast after the break. You can count on us. Save more than half price on fresh green asparagus, only $2.99 per pound. USDA bone-in ribeye steak, just $12.99 per pound, saving $7.00. Select varieties of Fab 2X laundry detergent, only $4.99 for a 50-ounce bottle. ShopRite lactose-free milk, just $3.79 for a 64-ounce cart. Kellogg's Corn Flake cereal, only $3.99 for a 12-ounce box. All stores open Monday through Saturday until 10 p.m. and Sunday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. for your shopping convenience. You can count on us. Philadelphia International Medicine provides international patients with access to a unique network of world-renowned doctors and surgeons that provide personalized medical and surgical care, connecting you to the U.S.'s leading healthcare specialists who are ranked among the best in the world. Healing is possible when you're confident in your healthcare team. To find out more, contact us at physicians at philadelphiamedicine.com or call 1-215-563-4733. Ever wondered what smart health insurance feels like? Colonial's 24-7 Worldwide Health Insurance does most of the thinking for you. 1,500 CGI health claims are settled daily. 60% of claims settled automatically. You can access your health plan almost anywhere, anytime. And have smart wellness with online data tracking. And more provider choices for you and the people who matter most. Premier Health is smart health insurance and it feels good. Colonial, where people come first. Senior citizens are some of the worst affected by the rising costs of living on the island, and those working closely with them don't see the problem easing anytime soon. So what support for seniors do they hope for in the upcoming budget? Jasmine Patterson sought to find out. Who wants to work their whole life to have to ask for support? It's common here to have pensioners sign on to receive food donations from the Eliza Doolittle Society. Over one-third of service users are over 65. In fact, half of all new sign-ups are elderly. If anything, demand just continues to increase um, unless there are significant changes made in the marketplace in, in some manner, whether it be... Um, uh, changes made by the government or um, additional support by other organizations. I, I just think we're it's going to continue to get worse. And what is it that seniors want? I think ideally seniors would like the opportunity to be a bit more self-sufficient, however that's achieved. Um, whether or not it's the opportunity to work a few more years after they're 65 or to have programs put in place that allow them to earn some sort of supplemental income. According to the latest government statistics, Bermuda's elderly population is set to rise to over 12,000 from 8,000 by 2020, up 38%. Seniors advocacy group Age Concern says it's aware of Bermuda's debt problem and is mindful of government's financial obligations when it comes to seniors. With the cost of living being what it is in Bermuda, seniors generally are looking for support um, most commonly with their pensions. Um, but then that would extend out to some of the public services and subsidies that are available. Funds allocated to the Ministry of Health and Seniors in last year's budget was slashed by $23 million, or 13 percent. It's a trend they hope will not continue. We certainly can see that um, community nursing, as an example, is, is, is certainly not what it was many years ago. And perhaps that's where some of the cuts have been made. And what that means is that um, there are seniors that perhaps can be maintained better at home, but without the support services are not being maintained. And that may be contributing to um, the hospital um, situation that we're currently experiencing. 
long-term care for seniors, and reversal of age discrimination legislation are main concerns they hope will be addressed on Friday during the budget presentation. Jasmine Patterson reporting for Bermuda Broadcasting News. The Bermuda Fire Department received 165 applications for new positions. That number was reduced to 18 and eventually 13 after rigorous training and medicals. The awesome 13 are on two years probation as firefighters as of February the 1st. Tonight in the first of a two-part series, the new batch of firefighters was asked by Mike Sharp, did they do anything special to prepare for becoming a firefighter? Yeah, my name is Dean Smith and for us to do any special training for myself to do special training to get into the fire service I decided to do the EMT course and with that course it gave me a vast knowledge and understanding of what this what uh, as us as first responders will have to do. My name is Dominic Nanette um, and to pre prepare myself to be a firefighter I guess I the two things I thought I had to do were physical strength and, and mental preparedness so I, I got out and I got myself in some shape and mentally prepared myself to, to join the job. My name's Thomas Hart. Uh, to prepare for the, being a firefighter, as soon as the process got further in, I started working a lot harder in the gym, get myself physically ready so I can take all the tasks that they give us. My name is Jordan Lamb, and um, the things I did to get ready to be a firefighter is um, every evening I used to turn my oven up to 450 degrees and <laughs> stick my head right inside. You know, but on a serious note, um, when I found out I was going to be a firefighter, I started to change my diet, started to exercise daily, and just prepare myself mentally for the challenges ahead. My name is Rai Soon, and uh, to prepare myself for uh, being a recruit, uh, um, just exercising and working out, and getting myself mentally stronger. My name is David Lambert. I, too, also mentally and physically prepare myself for the fire service as well. My name is Isaiah Casey. To prepare myself to be a firefighter, I actually started three years ago not knowing that this was going to be the new life for myself and I'm just, I'm just ready to, to take this journey one step at a time. My name is Diane Simmons and um, the steps I took to prepare to become a firefighter are to obviously um, physically stronger, to be physically stronger and mentally stronger as well. Um, I definitely had an interest in help, helping people as, you know, my lifestyle um, showed that. Now, my name is Shahid Amrani. Uh, the way is I prepared to become a firefighter, I basically, I know fitness was a major key, so I signed up to Beach, to beach Gym on Union Street, which prepared me fitness-wise, um, better eating habits, and through these stages of the recruit, we had uh, different exams, so when I knew I had an exam coming, I tried to prepare myself best for that exam. New information was, was brought forth, so I just prepared myself as best as possible, so it gave me a better opportunity to be successful, which I was, so it all paid off. Congratulations to the awesome 13. Turning to weather news, mostly cloudy with a few showers for our Wednesday. Here's the latest from AccuWeather headquarters. AccuWeather is presented by BFNM Insurance Group. We now go to AccuWeather headquarters. The BFNM Insurance Group is pleased to bring you this AccuWeather forecast here on ZBM. We're glad that you are with us as well. And we have some showers invading uh, tonight and especially into the day tomorrow. This is all tied to a front. You can see there's a big uh, stripe of activity approaching us. A lot of the tallest clouds and most numerous showers are to the north. Some are also knocking on our door to the west. So here's a, an estimate of where the showers are based on satellite. And you can see there is a, a significant increase in showers north and west of us, and they're generally moving to the east. So some of these will clip on through the area. Humidity is fairly high. Temperatures are right around 70 degrees. We have uh, virtually calm winds under three and four knots, and the winds are changing direction almost at random with such weak forcing and light winds, at least for now. The winds are going to ramp up though at the end of the week. Water temp, 69 degrees on the the inside, we have waves pretty flat, only around a foot. On the outside, we have four to five footers rolling around out there. And tonight, we do expect to see a couple of showers sneak in. It doesn't look like a long-lasting rain event, though. Just some scattered showers, and there will be a few more passing showers in the forecast for tomorrow. Temperatures peak around 70 degrees, so there won't be a big rise. Only about a five-degree difference from our lows to our highs. As we look at the uh, tide chart here, we have high tide at 7.08 tonight. 
Low tide just after midnight, around 1.20 a.m. High tide again for the early risers tomorrow morning, 7.32, and a low tide in the early afternoon on Wednesday at 2.02 p.m. So the gateway forecast is uh, fairly active, and here are the numbers for uh, the Caribbean. But as we look at the east coast of the U.S. and North America, Toronto, 39 degrees, partly cloudy. New York, a little milder out there tomorrow. Boston approaching 50. In Atlanta, 66, there are some showers into London. And across the Caribbean, we're dealing with some scattered showers and some spotty thunderstorms, mainly showers, though, as the trade winds continue to dictate the weather uh, in a significant way. So the extended forecast here, we have spotty showers on Wednesday, tied to our front, moving through the area uh, tonight into the day tomorrow. Thursday, pretty decent weather. 70 degrees will go mostly cloudy. Now, the wind is going to pick up on Friday, and there will also be a few showers in the area. So look out for them. Uh, but the wind will be uh, the most noticeable change beyond those pesky showers being driven by that breeze. Into the weekend, temperatures will be around 71, lows around 66. Not a bad stretch Saturday and Sunday, so we'll take that and run with it. A pretty decent forecast aside from a couple of hiccups. Once those winds pick up on Friday, though, keep an eye on the swimmers. Anybody out there on the kayak, there will be some rip currents and some larger waves as the wave heights certainly do increase into the end of the week. So enjoy the ride out there, stay dry, and don't forget the umbrella when you're out and about tomorrow. AccuWeather was presented by BFNM Insurance Group. with care, handled with care, delivered with care. That's what dreams are made of. For our viewers of certain age, this next story is sure to bring back a flood of memories. The year was 1954, and a boat making its way from India to the United States found itself marooned in Bermuda. But it was the special cargo this boat was carrying that would capture the hearts of Bermudians. Tony Waterman takes us back. They put the cage in the airplane, but the elephant wouldn't go in. Even the most imaginative well, author would be that. stretching their powers to spin a Bermudian tale like this. An elephant landed here in a boat because a rusty propeller broke. It was August of 1954. Gunda, a three-year-old baby elephant, was crossing oceans, moving from Calcutta, India, to a circus in the United States. But somewhere in the Atlantic, trouble struck, much to the unexpected delight of many. The children were happy as they could be, a real live elephant for them to see. The story spread quickly. Spectators swarmed eager to catch a glimpse of Gunda. Nancy Valentine, who later wrote a children's book about the elephant, was there with her two young children. Nobody had ever seen an elephant. At and I mean, so many of the children, mm -hmm. because nobody could travel right. at that time. It was front page news for days. But soon, a plan was hatched. Gunda would continue her journey, this time aboard Pan American Airways. She was hoisted off the boat, suspended in a sling, then gingerly lowered into a waiting truck. Operation Elephant was declared a success. But when we got it to the airport, it wouldn't get on the plane, and the Pan American pilot didn't want to take it. <laughs> so, you know, finally, the pilot said they, they had to go. They couldn't wait. So then, that's how it wound up at Stephen's house. And this is where we had the truck back then to here. Stephen West was 11 when his grandfather offered to host Gunda at Shelley Hall Farm in Hamilton Parish. Was it wide enough that she could fit through pretty easily? She or was brushed it. it. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was pretty fat. The so farm is long gone, but the memory is out. fresh. Like most island kids, Stephen had never seen an elephant before. And she was tied up over in this general area? She was tied up uh, just beyond that building corner. 
Mm -hmm. uh, on her back leg and she had a stake and she had a long enough rope she could come down into this area. Stephen had unfettered access. He cleaned up after her, took her on walks, and found the way to her heart. She ate two bunches of green bananas a day and a bale of hay. And when you ran out of food, she let you know. And at one time, she came over to me and I didn't have anything. She just lifted me with her trunk and put me right over a wall, at, at, uh, which was my grandmother's um, rose garden. Gunda stayed at Shelley Hall Farm for a week. Then, on August 25th, 1954, her final farewell. Cars lined both sides of Front Street. Hundreds gathered, their heads turned skywards, gazing at what was truly a spectacular sight. Gunda hoisted up in a sling, her trunk securely in her mouth, headed for the top deck of the Queen of Bermuda. On the Queen of Bermuda, she sailed in style, waving fond farewell to the Summer's Isles. Gunda eventually settled in the Tulsa, Oklahoma Zoo. Happy birthday! She died just last month, aged 67. I never saw her again, but you remembered her. In fact, I've remembered her uh, all through the years. They say an elephant never forgets. Neither does a Bermudian who's had an unexpected encounter with an unforgettable baby elephant. Tony Waterman for Bermuda Broadcasting News. Turning to sports, a Bermudian female footballer announced where she will attend college. The Bermuda men's national football team is to play in the Caribbean, and Bermuda youngsters help their high school win the state indoor championships. Earl Baisden has all the details and much more in tonight's sports report. Bermuda national women's team footballer Taya Lindo has announced the school of choice. Today I'm here to let Bermuda know that I have committed to Flegler College, located in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, I ran away in October to visit various schools, but Flegler was the one of the two schools that replied back. When I got there, um, when I went on a tour, I mean the coach took me on a tour, showed me the school, and then later on I trained with the team, and then I found out that I was offered a full scholarship. When I got back to, the first thing I did was tax my mama, and she was excited, and then I told Dankins. And so when I got, I knew that's where I wanted to go because of the atmosphere was nice, and I fit in with the girls, they were nice um, individuals. Tonight's sports is brought to you by the all-new Boundary at Fairmont Southampton, the West End's only sports bar. Catch all the action and enjoy smoked perfection barbecue, beer, and other pub favorites. It's game on at Boundary. Nathan Trott and his West Ham United under-23 teammates played to a 2-2 draw against Tottenham Hotspurs in their Premier League 2 London Derby last evening. The Bermuda Football Association announced that the Bermuda Senior Men's National Team will play two international friendly matches in March. Bermuda will continue their preparation for the CONCACAF Nations League, which will kick off during the fourth quarter of 2018. The team will travel south to the Caribbean to play Antigua and Barbuda's national team on March 21st, and then they will take a relatively short trip to Barbados to resume their rivalry when they take on Barbados' as senior men's national team on March 25th. Zakaya Lewis, Sejan Harvey, Matteo Dill, and Malik Joe all represented St. Johnsbury Academy, helping them to win the Vermont Division I State Indoor Championships. Lewis competed in the women's varsity long jump, finishing second with a top leap of 4.87 meters. Lewis would then finish sixth during the women's varsity 55 meter dash, stopping the clock in a time of 7.75. Lewis would lead off the victorious St. Johnsbury women's varsity 4x200 meter relay team that clocked a time of 1.50. 5303 Dill clocked 3885 on his way to finishing sixth while competing in the men's 300 meters, while Joe finished second competing in the men's varsity 600 meter race at a time of 130.77. Harvey finished second in the men's 1000 meters, stopping the clock at a time of 247.32, while in the men's varsity 4x400 meter relay, Harvey and Joe helped St. Johnsbury finish third, clocking a time of 345.93. Harvey and Joe were also members of the 
St. John's Bury Men's Varsity 4x800 meter relay team that clocked a winning time of 8.53.35. Dill finished fifth, competing in the men's long jump with a top leap of 5.48 meters. Dill would then finish second in the men's triple jump with a top leap of 12.49 meters. Jair Mitchell competed in the M-Soil Arena Cross Motocross event in Madison, Wisconsin. In the AX Lights East Regional Class, Mitchell finished 4th. He finished 11th in the qualifier and then 6th in the heat. Mitchell is in 10th in the standings with 20 points. During the Madison Arena 250 AX Class, Mitchell did not advance to the final this after he finished 20th in the qualifying heat and 8th in the first round heat. 21 goals were scored in a triple header at the National Sports Center as the Bermuda Field hockey season resumed. The Budgies picked up their second win of the weekend, having won their match on Friday evening, this time defeating the Canaries 2-1. Cassia White gave the Budgies the lead in the 13th minute with a field goal. Jasmine Patterson would double the lead with a field goal in the 57th minute. Terry Ann Mallett would pull a goal back for the Canaries with a field goal in the 60th minute, but they ran out of time looking for the equalizer. In other matches, it was the Sandpipers nil, Pink Robin 6, Mick B team 11 Ravens 1 Gillian Tessera and Tyler Lux began competing in the Future Stars International Horse Jumping event in Belgium. On day one, the pair only competed in one class, which was the 1.25 meter Table A against the Clock class. Tessera riding Aluna would finish second with a clear round time of 58.90. Tessera and Amarula finished sixth, clocking a clear round time of 60.05. And Lux riding Escalada finished 85th with a time of 64.85, but they would have 12 penalty four points. Some 50 riders took up the challenge of Paddle for Paralympics, riding from Royal Naval Dockyard, Clock Tower, and finishing at Ferry Reach. Riders had the pleasure of being joined at the start line by Bermuda Paralympians Jessica Lewis and Yushe de Silva Andrade. Lewis and her new coach, Curtis Tom, would then join riders as they traveled along Kinley Field. Tonight's sports has been brought to you by the all new boundary at Fairmount Southampton, the West End's only sports bar. Catch all the action and enjoy smoke to perfection barbecue, beer, and other pub favorites. It's game on at Boundary. I'm Earl Baisden with Bermuda Broadcasting Sports. The Marketplace Food Court is you and your family's one-stop shop. Start your day at the breakfast bar with omelets made to order and traditional Bermuda codfish breakfast. The chefs will cook lunch and dinner to your liking. Along with the salad bar, sandwich bar, sushi bar, and fruit bar, the Marketplace Food Court is your kitchen away from home. Every day is hassle-free with nutritious meals from the Marketplace Food Court. Visit us seven days a week. Homemade cooking, quality service, all at prices you can count on. The whole concept came from the collaboration with the FNM and the America's Cup. The Endeavour programme is the legacy of the 35th America's Cup that was here in Bermuda in June. And we've continued the, the charity now operating in Bermuda. And going forward, we thought, what a great opportunity for children on the autism spectrum. And hence, we actually developed the No Limits programme. They really do benefit from this kind of outdoor experience, this environment. You know, just yesterday, going off the east end of Bermuda. I mean, they wouldn't have done that. Not many children in Bermuda have done that. And just them learning to take control of a, a large bit of um, transportation that they're doing at that age. And they, they may never get that opportunity. That's where you see the biggest progress is. Whether they were looking at their hand steering, you know, it's, now they're looking forward and actually looking where they're going. Because they've realized, oh, I know where my hand is. I can, I can do this without looking at my hand. We are so grateful for the Endeavor program and what it has done for the students on the autism spectrum. The search is on for applicants to fill the role of regulators of key business sectors that are to fall under the purview of the regulatory authority of Bermuda. Those seeking to be members of the Board of Commissioners to whom the RA will report are expected to have their application submitted by Friday, February 23rd to the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Transport and Regulatory Affairs. The Board of Commissioners is currently responsible for regulating the energy sector and electronic communications sector apart from broadcasting. The principal functions and general powers 
powers of the RA include establishing technical industry standards, regulating tariffs by the providers, and establishing and enforcing service quality standards in the energy sector. For more information, log on to gov.bm and navigate to the Transport and Regulatory Affairs page. And before we leave you tonight, the Bermuda Broadcasting Company will be conducting maintenance starting at 1 a.m. Wednesday morning on both our ZBM TV 9 and ZFB TV 7 stations. More importantly, tomorrow, Wednesday, February 14th, is Valentine's Day, so please don't forget to look after your Valentines. That's our newscast for tonight. I'm Diane Brewer. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.